as a friend of mine in Hawaii used to say, this is a testing place, not a resting place. And he said that in Hawaii? He said that in Hawaii. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bible Geeks Weekly Podcast. This is episode 118. I'm Brian Sheely. I'm Ryan Choi. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We're in week 31 of our cross-training series. This week, we're talking about integrity and continuing that conversation by talking about character. What is character all about? Why is character so important? Yeah, absolutely. The Bible talks about how trials refine us like silver. They make us pure and they reveal who we are, which is what character is. Mm -hmm. So this week... If you've been watching any Olympics while you were in your hotel room in New Jersey, you probably didn't have a second to break away to to do that. Didn't even turn on the TV. Oh, man. You've been missing out on some cool stories. I love the Olympics. There's so many stories of courage and perseverance and teamwork and character. So there's this big superstar, Simone Biles, who Mm -hmm. was the American gymnast that was supposed to sweep all the medals and everything. And she stepped out of the Olympics because of some challenges that she was facing. So these other girls stepped up and with the whole world watching, they filled in her spot. They didn't have a moment to think about it. They just jumped in and, you know, they won silver. There's this girl, I think she's from Arizona, Jade Carey, who got her big shot at the Olympics. And then she miscounted her steps and she messed up her vault. And then the next night she came out in the final event and won gold on the floor. Nice. So there's all these kind of neat stories about people finding out for themselves really who they are by going through these difficulties. And I think when you watch something like this, it's not the athletics, it's not the medals. I mean, it's amazing to watch these humans do seemingly superhuman things, (laughs) but really it's the strength of spirit. It's these human experiences we all can relate to, even if we'll never be able to do backflips off a balance beam or whatever. And ultimately, that's what we're talking about today. When we talk about character, we're talking about this aspect of discipleship, how we follow Jesus when it gets tough and what we reveal about ourselves in those trials. This is like the spiritual pummel horse. I'm down. Let's do it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Let's stick the landing. (laughs) All right. So let's get into our first segment here on the episode. And that is Like the Teacher. Again, we're in week 31 talking about character in this discussion about integrity. And so let's go to a story here where Jesus teaches us about integrity and character. And I feel like it just makes sense for us to go to Matthew 7, the end of Jesus' great sermon on the Mount, where he talks about two people that we as children sung a lot about. The wise man who built his house upon the rock and the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Probably don't even need to tell the story. You got to do the hand motions while you read it. So I'll I'll be be over here doing the hand motions as I recall the story. So he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And obviously there's this big storm that comes. The wind is blowing, beating on that house. It doesn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. And anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on a sand. And then the rain fell, the floods came, winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell. So this story here to close out his sermon is really highlighting what it means to be a building of integrity, a building with strength and somebody who has character in their life, somebody who's gone through the test And on the other side of it passes the test. So what do you see here in this story that helps teach you about character? I think Jesus is putting it to us in black and white. And sometimes as much gray area as there is in the world, it's helpful to see things with this clear distinction like Jesus gives here. This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, the call to action, the stand and sing moment. (laughs) And everyone who hears Jesus, everyone sitting on that mountain around him, everyone listening today, is one of these two guys, the wise guy or the foolish guy. Mm -hmm. He leaves no room for sitting out of the story. He says, everyone who hears these words and does them, they're wise. Everyone who hears these words and doesn't do them, they're foolish. So unless you covered your ears and said, no, 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 to avoid hearing (laughs) his words, you are a character in the parable. So am I. Everyone who hears has this choice. What am I going to do? 
with what I've heard. And this whole sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is a sermon of contrast. There's good and bad treasure, good and bad eyes, good and bad trees. He wants us to choose to serve God or money. Take the easy road, the broad road, or you can take the hard, the narrow way. And here he says, hear me and do it or hear me and then walk away without boldly acting according to his teaching. So if you were listening along, like I'm sure a lot of people were just nodding right up until the end. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait, he's serious about us actually doing all this stuff, about turning the other cheek, about not divorcing our wives (laughs) for any other reason. You know, all these crazy, difficult things that he's telling them to do. He means it. And our character is revealed not by what we say or hear or feel or think or believe, not to minimize that stuff, but the true disciple reveals himself by doing what his teacher says. I like the black and white part of this because I think sometimes we do get lost in the gray. There is an important aspect of the gray area. There is obviously ways to apply things to me that may not apply to other people. There are issues of liberties, things that we're allowed to do either way. But with what Jesus is saying here, again, he is laying the gauntlet down. Like, this is not a question of, well, you don't have to do this, but I'd really like for you to, or it'd be a <laughs> really good idea if you did these things. I mean, he's just making it so clear. And yeah. that is the mark of a great teacher when you walk away and you know there is zero ambiguity here. Like, you know exactly what Jesus wants from you here. He wants you to take action. And I think mm-hmm. the action part of this is the key part. It's like, I don't know why, but we sometimes as preachers at the end of a sermon, as maybe part of an invitation that we might give, we might say, if you're here and you're subject to the gospel call, it's like, well, yeah, obviously you're here. Like everybody's here, <laughs> you know, like if you hear this, Jesus says, well, yeah, obviously they hear this. Like they're sitting there. They're, they've been listening to you this whole time. They heard you. Like The hearing part or the being there in the room part, that's not the important part. It's all focused on the doing part. And if you do or do not, there is no try. Like, I mean, this is a very (laughs) black and white kind of situation he's laying down for them. Yeah. The song we sing with the kids mixes this story with some other passages about Jesus being the foundation, which he absolutely is for mm-hmm. the, the church. But that's not the message of this. The The message isn't of, of this parable isn't just build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ by doing what he says. Right. That's the distinction here. And so, yeah, I, I mean, if you're going to bust out some Yoda right after busting out some Jesus. I mean, we've got some, (laughs) we've got some wisdom here being dropped. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this and does them are the three most important words here in this section because man, it is so easy to hear and not to do. We hear stuff all the time without taking action about it. You sit down on the couch and you're watching television and you see commercials coming at you on the screen and they're telling you to do this, they're telling you to go buy this thing. And we hear those kinds of calls to action a lot of times and we don't do anything about it. And it's probably better that we don't do anything about it in those cases, but (laughs) I think we're conditioned in our life to hear a lot of things, but not to actually act on it. And it takes a real thoughtful approach to hear something especially something as challenging as what Jesus is telling them to do, because this isn't just like, here, I've got one thing for you to do. He's had a couple of chapters worth of just some of the most challenging things for people to focus on. He's saying, you do all of these things. These are the things I want you to do. Hear these things, now get to work. So let's get into our second segment here on the episode, and that is heavy words. Whoa, this is heavy. There's that word again, heavy Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? So one of the key words we can focus on here in this conversation about character is the word that is most frequently translated as character throughout the Bible. And that's this Greek word, dokime, which means to try to learn the genuineness of something by examination and testing, often through actual use. To test, to examine, this word is used in Romans 5, in this word for character, It's also translated as a severe test of affliction in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2. And Paul uses the word to reference Timothy's proven worth. 
in Philippians 2 verse 2. This word, dokime, is really, it's about knowing for sure that something is genuine. It is solid and rock solid, and I know that because I've tested it. And in talking about our character, I think this whole testing part of it is really the important characteristic, because if you never test something, you never really know what it's actually made of. Yeah, exactly. I think the New American Standard translates it proven character. Which I love. Like, yeah, your character has been put to the test and shown to be who you are. And it reveals, I mean, God knows the future. He knows what you're going to do, but you don't get the chance to do it unless you're given that trial. You know, you never get the chance to run a five minute mile unless you run a race. Right. (laughs) You never get the chance to love your neighbor unless you're passing them by and see them like the Good Samaritan in difficulty, you know, on the road next to you. And so we get the chance to prove our character, prove it to ourselves, prove it to the Lord, to do what's right by going through the actual difficulty. And I think this word, it has a lot of connotations of like manliness or maturity, just these kinds of real almost like bravado kinds of words. It brings to my mind just a a real strong, you know, hands on your hips, kind of brawny man sort of thing. Like you're a man of integrity. You're a man of character. Like you're going to pass the test. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things we can miss is the process that Paul expresses in that passage in Romans 5. He talks about going from hope to perseverance to character. And in my fervor to man up, like you're saying, I can (laughs) I can jump to perseverance as the path to proven character and skip right over hope. How is character revealed when we keep doing the right thing, no matter how hard it gets? Well, that's perseverance. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? We believe God can work to make things better, that God is at work, even in the difficulty to bring a good end. He is already doing things, even when we can't see it. So hope is so important. It's the opposite of that crushing despair that thinks things can never change. We can never get stronger. Life is too much. What's the point anyway? That kind of thinking leaves us believing that life is like this torture chamber to endure that maybe someday we'll get out of it when it's all over. But the Bible doesn't really talk about it like that. The Bible does talk about it as a hard thing, as a furnace, as a pruning, as a period of difficulty and testing. But it's a journey where we learn and we grow and we discover new and wonderful things, even as we go through the difficulties. You know, if that Olympian that's training to win that gold medal didn't think that that training was doing any good while she or he was going through it, it would be harder to sustain that perseverance. But when you see not only the gold medal at the ending that you're trying to get to, but you see those improvements, you know, your time is one second faster. Or even when you don't see it, you believe that it's possible that you can get better, that you can make it through. Then you can persevere. So we we just we have to hope and have faith in God's hand at work in this life and certainly in the one to come. And I think that's Paul's point here. He says in Romans 5, verses 2 and 3, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's looking to the end of the race. We're going to be in glory with God and experience his full glory. But he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, (laughs) knowing that suffering produces, and then he goes on, suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces that proven character. So we rejoice about what's to come, and we even rejoice in what's happening now. That's far from health and wealth gospel, incredibly difficult times right now, especially for certain saints, especially for Paul as he was going through it. And yet he said, I see God's hand at work even now producing something in me in these surprising ways. He's building us into what we're meant to be. He's accomplishing his purpose and spreading the gospel and he's at work and we can trust him for that at the end and even in the midst of the difficulty. I love the focus on hope because I don't often connect hope with character. Mm. I think a lot of this really goes back to just a conversation about grace. We talked in the last section about grace and receiving grace and how that really enables us to be the kind of merciful people to others that the Lord has been to us. 
And I think when we really just focus on all the amazing things that God has done for us, all the gifts that he's given to us, the favor that he's shown us, I mean, doesn't that just want to motivate me to just keep pushing forward? You're talking Mm -hmm. about hope as this obviously looking forward to that home in heaven. But even just looking backward, we have plenty of reasons looking backward to Jesus on the cross to see if he went through that for me. Like, shouldn't I just continue to be pushing forward and, like you said, persevering here, but also just developing that kind of character, that strength in these trials and difficulties that we're going through? Like, shouldn't I be willing to go through this similar things or not even similar things to what Jesus went through and pass the test like he did? Just looking backward, looking forward, there is motivation everywhere, really, to be people of character. Yeah, that's it. You know, we don't have one tool in our toolbox to push us forward. Right. We can look forward in hope. We can trust in faith that he's at work now. We can be motivated by gratitude for what he's done. We can have love that responds to his love. We can just multiply the reasons. We can see each other struggling and stir one another on and be stirred on by others. There's lots of things that push us on. And I I think that's a good point, too, that we're going to need to summon every bit of strength and motivation that we can find. And we have a lot of sources of it in order to prove our character as we want to. I've been thinking in this section about heavy words, this word character kind of reminds me of like grit or mm-hmm. another word that I th- I feel like fits in here is metal, not M-E-T-A-L, but M-E-T-T-L-E, like a person's ability to cope well with difficulties or to face a demanding situation in a spirited and resilient way. That's Webster's definition mm-hmm. of metal. Yeah, that's going to test your metal. Exactly. And almost every time you talk about metal, it's about testing your metal, putting it on the table and just figuring out what it's made of. You got to prove it. And, you know, I'm not in the armpit of America anymore. I am now back home finally. But apologies to Jersey. Apologies again, of course. But for three weeks, we spent time on a military base testing our products. I mean, I'll tell you, they are not delicate and light. This is not a Fabergé egg that they are like dealing with (laughs) when they're out there testing this stuff. It is really being tested. It's metal is being put to the test. And you think about that with the military, but you think about that even with like aircraft parts and components. Mm-hmm. Like if something is going to be in an airplane, they are going to test that component nine ways to Sunday. And they're just not going to stop until they have put it through every possible test. There's actually a word that is referenced a lot. And it started with NASA, actually, when they were testing these products to be putting into the space station and to the rockets and things that went to the moon. It's this acronym TRL. And it's called Technology Readiness Level. And you can go look this up. There's a whole one to nine rating. Like, how ready is this technology to go into space? How ready is this to go into the air or to be sent with our military? And they'll basically just assign a number and say, okay, we have passed the test in this area. We've passed the test in that area. And as the product gets more mature, it's able to be closer and closer to that TRL level nine kind of requirement. Like you're ready to go. This thing is set and ready to be shipped out. And I guess it just kind of asks me the question, like, what's my TRL level? What's my spiritual technology readiness level? Like, what am I really able to handle? Have I proven my metal? Have I actually gone through the tests and know that I'm able to withstand those things? Or Am I just sort of cowering in the lab, unwilling to go out into the field and actually figure out what I'm made of? Yeah, yeah. So am I ready to rock it off? Am I ready for someone to put their life into my hands, right? Am I trustworthy enough for God to give me a task that is meaningful and important, knowing I will be faithful to that test? That's important for a a part we're depending on when we're flying in the air. And that's eternally important when we think about the the task we've been given. Yeah. And it just, I guess, reframes suffering, too, and difficulty. Mm. Because Mm -hmm. like you said, I mean, man, we really could just look at this as like a torture chamber. Like every day bad stuff is happening. Every day things are going wrong. Or we could look at it as an opportunity to refine us and to really 
check to see what we're made of. And not to get too personal here, but I mean, I know of people who over the last year and a half who were tested as, as I was tested through this whole pandemic and everything that happened. And I know people who just failed the test, sadly, and people who I've been praying for and I've been trying to talk to and remind them of why they signed up for the Lord in the first place. And these people just kind of fell by the wayside. And that is unfortunate. But it is another thing that you see as these tests come along. Some people are not going to pass the test. Some people are going to become even stronger through it. And so which one will I be when those tests come? And I hope I'm the one who gets stronger through it. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. This has been the year to talk about this test. I mean, as a friend of mine in Hawaii used to say, this is a testing place, not a resting place. So (laughs) it's always a place for tests. And he said that in Hawaii? He said that in Hawaii (laughs) and long before 2020. But this has been a year of challenges and a year to test our mettle for sure. So let's get into our last segment here on the episode. And that is through the week. I am ready to face any challenges that might be foolish enough to face me. So every week we drop five challenges that we're going to do, and we encourage you to do them along with us. This week we're focused on character, and our first challenge is a reading challenge. And this week we're going to read Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, Romans 5, verses 1 to 5, Philippians 2, verses 12 to 16, James 1, 12 to 27, and 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to through 11. And I focused on this sort of rather lengthy passage in James 1, where James is talking about being doers of the word and not just hearers only. And this relates well to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount there about building our house on the correct foundation and really doing the things that Jesus taught there. But I think what James is talking about here in this section has more to do with us remembering who we are than it really does anything else. I've often interpreted this passage here in James as like somebody who's staring at themselves in the mirror and they see something wrong. I don't know why I've read this into this passage or I've just been thinking about this view, but like James is talking about somebody who's standing in front of a mirror and then leaves and goes away from the mirror. And I always think like, oh, if I was standing in front of a mirror and I had some big mustard stain on my face or whatever, and I just walked away, like that would be a problem and I should really correct that. But right. I don't think that's what James is talking about here. He says, mm. but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So this is not talking about somebody who looks in a mirror and sees a fault and doesn't correct it. This is about somebody who looks in a mirror, forgets who they were when they, as soon as they walk away. And I just think about that so much as like, when you look into the Bible and you study God's word and you hear what Jesus is telling you, but then you walk away and you don't do anything about it, That is basically like forgetting what your face looks like immediately after looking in the mirror. (laughs) You forget what you look like. You see yourself in a reflection and you're surprised like a dog sitting in front of the mirror. You know, they don't know it's not another dog on the other side of the mirror. They think there's some, they want to attack it or whatever. It's like, it's you, dude. That's you. (laughs) And just a reminder though, like, who am I? And, And who am I meant to be? And hearing really is a great first step in understanding who we should be. But if it just stops there, then I think... I'm never going to become the person that I'm meant to be. I'm never going to be doing anything more than just like an academic exercise. Rather, just putting all these things into practice, putting my faith, putting my convictions, putting my character and my integrity into practice is something that I have to be doing after I've done all the work of hearing. Uh, I've never thought of that passage that way. That's really interesting. Makes a lot of sense what you're saying. And another thought-provoking question, (laughs) our reflect question. Uh, Next challenge is, what have my choices, attitudes, and trials revealed about me this year? And I had trouble with that question at first because I feel like I'm still in it. (laughs) You know, this question (laughs) requires you to find some space from what you're going through right now and think of the year as a whole. And backing away from the moment, looking way back down the trail from the mountaintop, I think I've passed more tests than I've failed. But the big thing I see is that the right path has been tricky to see at times. And even in retrospect, 
it's hard to see what I should have done in certain situations. Like, did I make the right choice? Maybe I did, but maybe there's this completely opposite way I could have gone Mm -hmm. that would have been better. And it's, it's hard to know because there are these finely discerned distinctions sometimes in how to handle situations, how to talk to people. I think I could have been firmer with people at times, but I also could have been gentler and more supportive even when I didn't completely agree with what they were doing or saying at times. And it's just that constant process of recognizing the challenges and trying to calibrate exactly where you should be whenever you face this again and recognizing that a lot of things are black and white, like we talked about earlier, but a lot of times it's really hard to distinguish those right choices. And and there's a lot of area to navigate that feels kind of gray. At times I've felt like this need myself to be a square peg jumping into this round hole I see in front of me, (laughs) taking on these roles and tasks that I'm not ideally suited for. And the big lesson in all of this to me, God has revealed my weak faith at times and taught me to trust him more. And I, I've learned that prayer is how I'll get the job done more than my efforts alone and that I have to trust other people more and do less at times, where this is kind of the opposite side of what we just talked about. Oh, yeah. About doing, you got to be doing, but sometimes the job isn't yours to do. Sometimes it's God's to do and we pray to him. Sometimes it's somebody else's to do. Mm -hmm. And it's been very humbling and very revealing as a year. And I'm sure that as others reflect on this year and the choices, the trials, the, the different attitudes we've had, I think that it will prove to be for a lot of us a revealing year in good ways, in beneficial ways that helps us to grow. I think anytime we really start honestly looking at the progress we could have made or the things we could have done or the things we shouldn't have done, maybe in that way of evaluating ourselves. Like you said, it's tricky and it is going to be hard for us to determine, like, was that the right decision? Should I have done something differently? But I think like when we started this episode, we were talking about the Olympics. You are not really going to take somebody who has invested that much time and energy and just have them make a wholesale, totally different change I mean, almost all the changes that they make and the tweaks and the improvements are just little things, like real Mm -hmm. small things, small mental shifts, small routine changes. And I think even that for ourselves, if we're really serious about honing and perfecting our character, it may not be a giant change that needs to be made. Sometimes it could just be a small character shift, a small shift in mental state or attitude towards something that makes all the difference for us. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. (laughs) That, that, That a big part of what has been revealed to me is the need for those little adjustments and how much work and attention to detail our spiritual life deserves, kind of like that high level training to do the perfect dive or the perfect soccer kick or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So our next challenge here is a request challenge where we'll pray to the Lord, Father, refine me in the furnace of my trials. And that comes from Isaiah 48 verse 10. This is a hard one because we're praying to the Lord to do something for us in our trials. And we need to be ready for trials to come. These are the kind of prayers that you pray when you're prepared for the trials to come. We all have trials. We all go through things. We all have tests of our character. We've touched on this idea about refinement and purifying ourselves. And I think that's where this ties into last week's conversation that we skipped on purity. Of course, this whole idea of refinement is about purity. It's about scraping away the garbage that floats on top. And you find out what you're made out of when you go through difficulty. How do you face that? How do you deal with it? Did you snap back in anger? Did you deal with it quietly and humbly? You know, whatever it is, you really know, like, when you're in that situation, what you're made out of. And for the Lord to refine us is really a powerful thing because he is the one who knows what we're made out of. He knows exactly what impurity is floating around in our life. He needs to help show that to us so that we can deal with it. And we really are not great at evaluating ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we just allow these impurities, these wrong motives, whatever it is, to cloud our minds. And we don't see it as clearly sometimes. But it's such a blessing to be able to pray to the Lord 
and ask him to give us some perspective so that we can respond with integrity the next time that we're tested like this. Yeah, and it is a hard, that's a scary prayer to pray, I guess, <laughs> in, in, yeah. in, in some ways. But you have to see the blessing of being refined as something worth pursuing. And if we do that, then we will also see it as worthy of praising God for, which is our respond challenge, to look back at the past year and give thanks for a difficulty that you faced, recognizing the growth God can bring from it. And there's a song called Blessed Be Your Name that this made me think of. It talks mm -hmm. about blessed be your name when everything is going right, when the world is all as it should be. But also blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Yeah. Though there's pain in the offering. And it talks about how every blessing you pour out, I'm going to turn back to praise. But when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I'll say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And what I love about that song is it doesn't really give a reason why we praise him even in suffering. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, but I'm still going to praise you because you're going to do really good things for me. <laughs> even though he is, but that's not what it says. It just says my heart will choose to say. It's just this resolve within us. I praise God. My heart will choose to say, blessed be your name. But when you do choose to praise him, you start to see all the reasons to praise him in the darkness and the difficulty. And I think the choice can unveil your eyes so that you can see his goodness even more. We went through a lot as a church this year here in Fort Wayne. It was rough. And when I remember to notice when I choose to bless his name, I just get amazed at what God is doing through those difficulties, through all the things that have happened and continue to, to happen. And not lightly, not easily, but I really do thank him for the difficulties of this year as I see these surprising answers to prayers all over the place. Well, and I think that leads us to our last challenge here, which is a reach out challenge. And that's to ask somebody a spiritually focused question. And this week we're going to ask each other, how has suffering strengthened your character? So Ryan, how has suffering strengthened your character? I think it has pruned me. That idea of pruning, like you prune a plant that is growing all out of control. I mm -hmm. grow all out of control in my life sometimes. <laughs> Trials streamline my life. When it's hard, when things get really difficult, a lot of times Adrian and I will quote this guy, Chris McGough, who said, to do this work, you have to be healthier than all the world is sick. Yeah. When things are difficult, when the stakes are high, I see what I'm doing matters. I start cutting out all the stuff that doesn't help me do God's work well. And it just highlights the importance of my devotional practices, my family, my health, my relationships and the work that I'm doing. And the other stuff that I've accumulated like a snowball rolling down the hill just because life <laughs> just kind of adds stuff to us. I don't know how it happens, but there's this constant need to just have this recurring pruning. And I don't seem to prune myself well enough <laughs> and fully enough. And so life does it. I think the Lord does it. Jesus said in, in John 15, I'm the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, these are the good ones. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. What do you want to be? The one that gets chopped off or the one that gets pruned where all the stuff that isn't producing as much, but is taking resources gets trimmed off so that I can bear more fruit. Yeah. And I think just the whole idea of pruning just brings you that painful aspect even more. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, suffering is not, this is not just like explaining it away as some easy thing. Pruning on the surface of it looks really destructive until you realize that it's done with skill and it's done thoughtfully and it's done in a way that brings health to the plant, not tears it down. I mean, I could, sure, I could just prune a plant by like chopping it off at the roots. That's probably not a good idea if I want the plant to live. And again, maybe it just was a reminder that we've not been tempted more than what we're able to deal with. There's always a way of escape when these temptations come. And just really understanding that whatever we're going through, whatever suffering we've faced, we're not alone. There are others who have faced these things. There are others that we can look to to draw strength from and especially each other. But remembering how pruning is 
not a comfortable situation to be in, in the moment. But after a while, you look back on it and you're like, man, I'm so glad I went through that because I am so much more prepared and productive for the Lord now than I would have been had I not done that. And I think that leads me to think about myself in asking this question, how has suffering strengthened your character? I think it's just brought me more patience. It's so easy not to be patient with people for me. It's so easy for me not to be patient with myself sometimes, just to expect too much of myself, to demand too much of myself and of my time. But I think there are so many times where I've failed tests, and then I start thinking about the opportunity I have the next time to try again and to do better the next time, and how patient the Lord is with me. I know this is kind of a conversation maybe more about mercy that we talked about recently, but patience Mm -hmm. here just is such a highlighted missing characteristic from my life. When I go through suffering and difficulty, it just reminds me to be more patient with myself, to be more patient with other people, to give myself more time, to not rush things and try to expect too much. Like there was a time there, even during this whole pandemic, where it was like, what'd you do today? I got out of bed and I took a shower. It's like, (laughs) win, (laughs) big win. (laughs) Like, you know, like... (laughs) You know, don't expect yeah. too much from people. And and I think that is, for me, just helping to clarify what it means to bear with people as the Lord bears with me. Yeah, I think patience is closely related to perseverance, too. Oh, yeah. And it's certainly part of the character we want to exhibit. I mean, all of this ultimately, in a way, character could be said to include all of the marks of the master we're going through, right? It certainly could, yeah. You know, all all the things that Jesus exhibits, all the things that he tells us to do, our character is us living with those things and exhibiting those attitudes and fulfilling his commandments in all of the challenging situations that we go through. We will require God's mercy and patience because we're not going to to do it perfectly. But yeah, I think that patience is a big part of that journey through the difficulties, knowing we're not going to get there in a day. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. it takes time for sure. It takes a lifetime, really. <laughs> and I yeah. think that's the whole thing. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Our life is not about just instantly becoming the people that we always wanted to be. Like, we're just always on the journey. And yeah. just remembering that and remembering that every day we wake up, there's another opportunity there for us to prove what we're really made out of. And I guess as we finish up this conversation about integrity next week, we're going to be talking about something that seems a little bit odd. What are we covering next week? We're going to get into courageous speaking. A big part of integrity is virtue, and virtue is moral courage. So we wanted to make sure that we dealt with this aspect of courage within our integrity, the courage to be truthful, the courage to be bold when we need to be, the courage to say what needs to be said, especially as we think about integrity in relationships. And I think it's really easy to, you know, just try to make things comfortable and harmonious and easy (laughs) and peaceful, maybe be a people pleaser sometimes instead of saying what needs to be said. And that doesn't mean that it's always going to be courageous speaking in conflict. Sometimes courageous speaking is a word of encouragement. Sometimes it's a word of mercy or forgiveness, but it takes courage to say hard things that take us out of our comfort zone. I'm just trying to think of something here to say that's confrontational. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. You should speak courageously. Stop it. No, you should. The episode <laughs> is over. Quit it. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the Bible Geeks podcast. You can find us on our website at BibleGeeks.fm. You can find show notes for this episode in your podcast player of choice or at BibleGeeks.fm slash 118. You can also follow along with this cross-training series on our website as well. And if you want to support the show... We would absolutely love it if you would tell a friend about what we're doing here in this cross-training series or in all of our past episodes that we've had. We're up to episode 118, so there's quite a lot in our back catalog to go through. Thank you so much for supporting the show by telling someone about it. And until next week, everyone, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom. Shalom.